Section 2 Philosophy and Theory live stream lecture. Welcome, welcome. It is a beautiful, somewhat sunny morning here in Washington, and we're going to be spending the next 45 minutes delving into what I believe to be one of Zizek's most interesting ideas, namely that of Epur si muove, or and yet it moves. If you're new to this community, our learning community, uh, I hope you'll stay a while. If you're curious about how this got started, essentially two years ago, or by now actually three years ago, uh, while I was still working at Oxford Brooks in the United Kingdom, the pandemic happened and I decided to take my lectures online for free. I began hosting a weekly lecture series that anybody could join. At first, it was just a couple of people, you know, people, students I knew from Oxford Brooks. And over time, it became this global community of like-minded students and learners like yourself. So here I am, three years later, now an independent educator, teaching, writing, and just, I don't know, getting to do my work online. So thank you guys so much for still being a part of this community. And the essential premise of this entire project from day one has been to take relatively abstract theoretical ideas within so-called continental philosophy or theory, psychoanalysis, Marxism, Hegelianism, Zizekianism, etc., and to explain them in a way that hopefully respects your intelligence, so that is not just dumbing it down into content or entertainment, but nevertheless remains accessible to a relative beginner. And so I hope that these lectures, above all, will instill in you a kind of appetite or passion for further learning and reading that you can then embrace in your own life. That these lectures, rather than being sort of standalone and complete in and of themselves, will provide you with a kind of inroad into what could be a lifelong passion for further philosophical learning, study, and reading. At least that's been the case for me. Uh, a huge thank you, as per usual, to our patrons who continue to make this open access channel possible in the first place. One of my biggest dreams in life, one of the things that I believe in above all, is that education should be free, that learning should be accessible to anyone, anywhere. And I'm trying to make that happen with this project. I'm trying to prove that we can have open access, high level education. I mean, high level by which I mean not simply content, and it's the patrons who allow me to keep doing this. So thank you on behalf of everybody watching uh, to the patrons. And if you'd like to become a patron, you can join for just $5 a month. And collectively, it really does make a huge difference in terms of keeping this project alive and well. I also have a brief housekeeping note, which is that my ebook, Spurious Infinities, is available for one more week, then it will disappear forever into the digital ether. And if you'd like to download my ebook, you can find that on Patreon. Uh, for those of you who are new to this, I essentially have an ebook subscription service on Patreon, where after the end of every lecture series, so after the end of three months, because every series is 12 weeks, once I conclude a lecture series, I release an accompanying ebook, usually about 100 pages, that allows you to read a short form version of these lectures, since I understand that not all of you can tune in for three months at a time. Now, Spurious Infinities was based on the previous lecture series, and since today we are reaching the end of the current lecture series titled And Yet It Moves, this means that you have one more week to download the previous ebook before the next one is published on Patreon. That also means that if you sign up to Patreon today, you will actually be able to access both ebooks for the price of one. If you sign up this week, so before the end of the month, before May 1st, you will be able to download both the current ebook and the next ebook as if you'd only purchased one month's subscription. That being as it is, thank you so much um, for letting me produce this book. I really hope that those of you who have downloaded it have enjoyed reading it as much as I've enjoyed writing it. On that note, let's dive right in. Today, we're gonna have the concluding lecture in the And Yet It Moves series. If you're completely new, that's okay, because I'm gonna to try to host this as a standalone lecture. And what I'm gonna to try to do today is actually explain the title, And Yet It Moves, Epor Si Muove. And I'm gonna to try to do that in a way that will hopefully help you understand why Zizek decided 
not to have it be the title of his most famous book on Hegel. That's right. Epor si muove, and yet it moves, was supposed to be the title for Zizek's book on Hegel, his magnum opus. You could call it the alternate title. The title that he ended up choosing was Less Than Nothing, which I've also explained in another video. And so in this lecture, I'm going to try to sort of dissect or analyze what Zizek has in mind when he talks about And Yet It Moves, and why it's so important for Zizek from a conceptual, on a conceptual level. Uh, I also want to briefly say that we are live on both Instagram and YouTube, so briefly let's say hello to each other. Hello YouTube over here, and hello Instagram below. Make yourselves comfortable. We are about to begin. Okay, one sip of coffee for the road. Before I go to the valley below. Okay, on that note. Epor si moeve, and yet it moves is a reference to an anecdote about Galileo. Now, you may already know this, but the story goes like this. Galileo was made to confess that his discovery that the Earth was not, in fact, the center of the universe, but that the Earth revolved around the sun, was, in fact, false, that it was a heresy. And Galileo, forced to make this confession, nevertheless, in walking away, is supposed to have muttered under his breath, and yet it moves. Et pour si move. In other words, I've just confessed that the earth is immobile, that it is the static core or center of the earth, and yet, secretly, it moves. Now, this epur si moove, this, this resistance muttered under Galileo's breath, is something that Zizek uses to draw out multiple different theoretical consequences. Think about propaganda, for example. One of the interesting things about propaganda, and Orwell already knew this, Orwell, who at the time was working for the BBC, wrote in this journal a really interesting insight, which is that part of the BBC's propaganda wasn't simply that it presented untruths or misinformation. Part of the propaganda of the BBC was the institution itself. In other words, Orwell pointed out that propaganda, in order to be propaganda, doesn't have to be untrue. Now think about that for a moment, because the more radical insight is, of course, that prep propaganda can be propaganda, perhaps even more so, precisely when it is true. That the truest form or the deepest form of propaganda isn't to misinform the public, but precisely to present the facts supposedly neutrally in a way that is overdetermined by the incentive structure of the institution, namely the BBC, the, the, the communication arm of the British Empire. Now, here I actually have something funny, which is, it was recently I read that in China, for example, the word propaganda doesn't have this negative implication that it has in the West. Propaganda is seen as the communication of the state. And hence, when the Chinese opened a institute of propaganda in the United States, they quickly realized that this was a very poor way of framing it. And so instead, the Institute for Propaganda was simply renamed the Institute of Mass Communication and Entertainment. After all, if you go back to the 1990s, this was part of the Chinese insight that what they envied the most was precisely what the Americans were able to do in Hollywood, which Hollywood, as the most enormous and most effective propaganda machine, because it's not just propaganda for the U.S., but propaganda for the world, wasn't simply spouting lies, but it was spouting dreams and desires and fantasies. Here we have another version of the way in which ideology and propaganda functions, not simply because it's misinforming you, but precisely because it's teaching you how to desire, how to frame the world, how to interpret the events that are happening around you. Now, Orwell's insight, therefore, that propaganda can still be propaganda, in fact, might be even more so propaganda precisely when it is true, is an example of yet it moves. It is true, and yet, it is 
propaganda. Nevertheless, it is propaganda. This fundamental seeming paradox by which something retains its identity in its own seeming negation is what interests Zizek. You can think of other examples of this. Think about one of the core tenets of the Christian faith, which is the act of prayer. Prayer isn't the direct communication with God. Prayer isn't saying, God, I have this thing that I demand of you and I would like you to do it for me. That would be a kind of vulgar exchange. And it would also have the narcissistic implication that you believe somehow that God owes you something. Instead, prayer is a message that is destined or bound to fail to reach its recipient. The very act of prayer is therefore a failed or stalled communication. It's a message that fails and yet it works, right? The entire act of prayer, the collective staging of the faith on behalf of the prayer itself is therefore another example of the constitutive paradox of and yet it moves. The prayer failed to reach its intended recipient and yet it did, and yet it moved. Here we actually have one of my favorite Zizek pieces of theology or his engagement with Christianity is to argue that this is how we should interpret the story, or not the story, the um, biblical passage about Job. That Job is in fact perhaps the first critique of ideology. The way in which Zizek makes this argument is essentially to say that when God inflicts suffering upon Job in the famous sort of almost like a wager or challenge that God has with Satan, that Job's response isn't simply to practice stoicism, that Job doesn't simply, you know, put up with it and have a stiff upper lip. In fact, Job complains about his predicament. And yet what's key is that when Job is confronted with the interpretations of the other interpreters, the theologians, as to why he is suffering, Job radically resists any kind of interpretation of meaning that would justify his suffering. This is what Zizek calls throughout his work the, um, the necessity of, and I'm going to use the conceptual term here, to uh, resist the hermeneutic temptation. Namely, to resist the temptation to interpret something according to its content. And so when Job is suffering, when, when, when suffering is inflicted upon Job, instead of practicing or succumbing to the hermeneutic temptation by which he tries to interpret his suffering in terms of what have I done to offend God? What have I done to deserve this kind of fate? How can I change my way? Which would therefore be a distinctly pagan interpretation of the relationship between God, the inscrutable arbiter of justice, and man as the lost soul trying to decide how to appease the gods. Think after all, the, the, the central premise or tenet underlying the, um, the Greco-Roman relationship to uh, the gods was do ut deit, give so that you might receive, that there's essentially a relationship of exchange between human beings and the gods. And that the gods, not always following the logical incentive structure of human beings, therefore might be irrational in the way that they act and therefore have to be appeased by man. This would be to interpret, therefore, Job's suffering as a form of punishment that he then has to somehow uh, 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 change his ways would therefore be a distinctly pagan way of interpreting this relationship. Instead, what Job does is that Job refuses, strictly speaking, to interpret the reason for his suffering. Instead, he accepts the much more radical conclusion, which is that, strictly speaking, his suffering has no meaning, that it is meaningless. Here we have the more radical implication of resisting the hermeneutic temptation, which therefore leads us to Zizek's argument that the book of Job is, in fact, the first critique of ideology. Namely, he is not interested in the content of what is occurring to him. In other words, what is occurring to him? He's interested in the manner in which it is occurring to him, nevertheless, despite not being a bad man. Here we have again the and yet it moves function, which is Job, strictly speaking, is not a bad person, and yet it seems that he is being punished. 
Of course, the key insight is that if his punishment, if the suffering that is brought upon him is meaningless, then strictly speaking, it is not a punishment. After all, punishment has the ethical normative descriptor of being a kind of retribution for a violation against the norm. In other words, the idea that Job would have sinned and that he's therefore facing some form of divine punishment. In resisting the hermeneutic temptation to infer any kind of ethical meaning to his suffering, Job therefore confronts God not with his potency, but precisely with his impotence. Namely, and this is a really like a beautifully shocking passage that Shishak has. Shishak says, what if it is precisely Job who on behalf of God refuses to blame God? In other words, God, uh, in other words, Job, knowing full well that God is strictly speaking impotent, that God has no power to inflict suffering upon him in such a direct way, that Job continues to act as if what were happening were just in order to allow God to save face. Hence also Zizek's interpretation of the final passage of the book of Job, where God has this kind of uh, irrational, mad boasting in which confronted with Job, he says, who do you think I am? I am the greatest creator of things and I stand above all time and my storms are the mightiest, etc." This is precisely the image in the Bible of God's impotent rage, of God trying to prove to Job in the same manner in which a father who has already lost his authority, that he is almighty. And it is precisely Job who in his muteness, who in his relative silence is no longer cowering before God, but almost like the slightly disappointed son is believing in the father on behalf of the father himself, who has already lost his symbolic authority. Therefore, interestingly enough, if you look at the wager between God and Satan, you realize the more damning conclusion of the book of Job, therefore has to be that it is not Job who is being tested, but that it is perhaps God himself who is being tested. Now here we have once again from a theological approach the idea of and yet it moves, that it's precisely in the meaninglessness of Job's suffering that we have an indictment against the structural mechanism, namely the power of the so-called holy divine of the beyond and the man who exists in this gap. One of Zizek's argument about theology, which I can get to in a moment in relation to Hegel, is precisely that one of the things that Christianity accomplishes is to transpose the gap between the absolute and man, and between the absolute and the world of objects, back into the absolute itself. And that the transposition of this gap therefore creates the truly if you will, abysmal agency of humanity having to act on accordance of its own ethical assumptions rather than simply trying to be reunited with the Godhead or in a Kantian manner having to act in accordance to what one believes might be the way in which God would like one to act. Here Zizek has another, I don't want to do too much theology here, but Zizek has a, has a nice way of relating this to the event. Now, the event is, is a theory that he takes from Alain Badieu. Alain Badiou's theory of the event isn't simply something that happens in the world, like something that you read in the newspaper. Instead, it's a much more uh, interesting metaphysical proposition. Think about what is the event in Christianity, the constitutive core of Christianity? Well, strictly speaking, it is, of course, the crucifixion. It is the death and subsequent resurrection of Christ. In other words, you could also say the beginnings of the New Testament, the so-called, or the Passion. Therefore, and this is Zizek's argument apropos Bajo's theory of the event, therefore the relationship between Christianity and Judaism is that Christianity is not simply a continuation or a rebuttal of Judaism, but precisely something that occurs only against the backdrop of the Judaic faith. One way to interpret this, again, is to go back to the event. Within Judaism, the idea is that the event has not yet occurred, that the Messiah is still to come, that Christ, strictly speaking, is a false prophet. This means that within the Jewish faith, we have the, if you will, surplus enjoyment of setting the table of the, of the rites and the rituals in order to prepare for this event, 
that will that will absolve us essentially. Whereas within Christianity, something much more traumatic occurs. Within Christianity, strictly speaking, the event has already happened. Christ has already come. He has already died for our sins and been resurrected. And so it's a little bit like cleaning up the dishes after the party and not knowing what to do the next morning. In other words, what happens within Christianity is that rather than having a kind of do mongering where one waits for the apocalypse, which is therefore strictly speaking simply the refusal to engage with the traumatic realization that the event has already occurred, therefore it becomes a regression into a kind of paganized Judaism. Instead, the properly Christian realization is that in the wake of the event, it is now up to us to act, to live up to it to have to put it in Bajo's terms, fidelity or loyalty to the event. Now, what this means, strictly speaking, is that if you look at Christianity from the perspective of and yet it moves, you could argue that the event has already happened. It has already taken place. It is done. It is dead. And yet it moves. And yet precisely because, in a sense, the crucial thing has already occurred. It is now up to us to fill in the gap afterwards, the day after. Here, of course, you can make a link to theories of revolution. The key revolutionary act is never the moment of revolution as such. It's never just the tearing down of the institutions. The key revolutionary act is what happens the day after the revolution how you build <clears throat> upon the supposedly blank slate. Here we have again, and yet it moves, which is that the revolutionary spirit emerges precisely the day after the revolution, the day after the old has been discarded, but the new has not yet been born. Now, I'm going to take these ideas, I'm going to try to link them back to a metaphysical argument that Zizek makes. Let's go back to the original anecdote about Epor Simoove, which is, what is the Galilean insight? Well, the Galilean insight, which was not entirely new, was that the Earth, rather than being the immutable static core of the universe, the center of the universe, <clears throat> that it was, in fact, the Earth that revolved around the Sun. If you will, you could almost argue here that the Christian church behaved like contemporary object-oriented ontologists who were saying, we have to focus on the earth as the core of truth, etc. And Galileo's argument, which therefore mirrors a metaphysical premise that I'll explain in a moment, is that if we look at the binary, seemingly binary division between the sun and the earth, that it is not that the sun revolves around the earth, but that it is in fact the other way around, that the earth revolves around the sun. So far, so good. And yet in this dialectical inversion, we have what later becomes reenacted within Kantian critical transcendentalism. After all, pretty much up until Kant, the idea was <clears throat> that the objective of philosophy was to determine essence or truth. In other words, that objects or the world of appearances was something which revolved around the sun of truth. You can see this quite literally if you go back to the allegory of the cave and the blinding sun that you cannot look directly into. <clears throat> Kant, of course, strictly speaking, begins to invert this relationship by investigating critically the conditions by which one might look into the sun. And for Kant, as you will probably know, the thing in itself cannot be reached. Hence, Kant essentially creates a negative ontology by which because essence is overdetermined by reason, in other words, it is conceptualized, this becomes a barrier to it. This means that Kant, even though he, strictly speaking, makes the Galilean move, which is to investigate into not the earth as the essence, which, oh, sorry, which is that 
uh, Kant, strictly speaking, argues that the objects, the worlds of appearances, contains the essence. He nevertheless upholds the idea that essence lies outside the world of appearances. <clears throat> I realize we're getting the metaphors a little bit confused here. So let's take a step back. Now, it is Zizek's argument to link this, the Kantian turn, the so-called Kantian Copernican turn, <clears throat> back to the idea that Freud has about the pleasure principle, the death drive, and the so-called nirvana principle. But before I explain that, I want to give you a little example. There's a well-known uh, anecdote that Freud has about his grandson. And in the anecdote about his grandson, the, grandson, uh, the grandson's mother has left the house. And while the mother has left the house, the grandson is playing with a little spool. And the grandson, in playing with the spool that's going back and forth, the grandson is saying, fought, da, fought, da, which essentially translated from the German means away, fought, and da, here. Now, the slightly simplistic Freudian interpretation would, of course, be the symbolic one to say, well, the son, the grandson, fears the loss of the mother. And so in order to master his anxiety, in order to take control of it or to assume it, he symbolizes it in this game. Namely, now the mother is there and she is gone. She is there, she is gone, or gone and there, fought, da. However, and this is where Zizek points out the Lacanian interpretation, which one might therefore make, isn't it not the other way around? Isn't it that rather than enforcing symbolic mastery upon the anxiety that the mother is gone, isn't the deeper anxiety precisely that when the mother leaves, it is in fact the son who is gone. That the son realizing that he is the object of the mother's desire has to constitute himself apropos her when he is left in the wake of her disappearance. In other words, the spool, the simple game of fought da, of away and here, is no longer the symbolization of the mother's disappearance, which would be the source of anxiety for the son, but instead is the other way around, which is the constitutive necessity of symbolizing the son, who, strictly speaking, uh, uh, no longer exists as the object of the mother's desire when she has disappeared. Zizek draws from this an even more um, uh, existential conclusion, which is to say, isn't this precisely the necessary act of all constitutive agency? that we have to invent ourselves in the face of being the object of somebody else's desire. Hence, what the son is doing, the grandson, isn't simply to control his fear about the loss of the mother, but strictly speaking, to control his fear about the loss of himself, which is therefore overdetermined by the desire of the mother. Now we can relate this back to the relationship between the death drive and the nirvana principle because they're not simply opposed. Instead, the death drive is that which, if you will, is kind of stuck within the nirvana principle itself. Let me explain the two terms before we go on. <clears throat> the nirvana principle is essentially the idea that what we strive for is a heightening of pleasure or enjoyment, that therefore we exist in order to attain a kind of a peak happiness, as it were that we all start at a kind of base level and that we're trying to work our way up towards it, that the central animating drive of life is therefore pleasure or happiness. <clears throat> now, this would correspond seemingly to the pleasure principle. If the pleasure principle is that we exist in order to be happy, then the nirvana principle is that we try to achieve the highest state of happiness. Freud, of course, complicates this idea with the death drive. Now, importantly, the death drive isn't simply like the linear opposite to the nirvana principle. It's not that we have on the one hand the movement towards nirvana or for Freud the movement towards death, kind of self-destruction. The idea that, yes, we try to make ourselves happy, but secretly we harm ourselves and we try to make ourselves unhappy. Instead, the death drive is precisely that which persists in the pleasure principle against itself. In other words, we have here, once again, and yet it moves, which is that it appears that within the pleasure principle, we have the linear forward movement towards our own enjoyment and happiness, and yet there is something that moves 
in the opposite direction in order to sustain it. To put that a little bit less esoterically, what Freud argues in The Death Drive is that secretly, and this is the central insight of all psychoanalysis, secretly, we don't want to be happy. This is one of the things that annoys me about some of the more vulgar, popular, psychological, uh, philosophical interpretations which romanticize or celebrate suffering. The romanticization of suffering, all oh, life is suffering and life and humanity is simply pain, of which the more radical elements are distinctly anti-humanist, which argue that since human life is fundamentally about suffering, that the most rational decision is to simply end human life, etc. It's a deeply dehumanizing uh, belief. Um, I can return to that. Uh, Anti-humanism is an interesting uh, philosophical uh, detour, if you will. However, this belief in the centrality of human suffering nevertheless upholds a kind of linear spectrum upon which we have happiness posited as the highest state of or condition of being and suffering as its, as its subtraction, as, as suffering as that which in a sense robs us of our happiness and that when we suffer, we are therefore not happy. Freud's insight, which is a key constitutive insight within psychoanalysis, is that rather than seeing happiness and suffering as being binary opposites, that in fact, we seek out unhappiness as its own mode or form of enjoyment. Let me give you an example here. Think about Catholic guilt. One of the sort of slightly, I'm gonna confess here, a slight annoyance, about many liberal atheists is that they usually say something like, I can live happily because I don't suffer from Catholic guilt. The implication being that Catholics are these simple creatures who cannot fully enjoy life because they are, have this impediment of guilt that constantly hangs above their head. The thing that is missed here is that guilt is precisely what allows enjoyment to persist. Now, I'll make the argument very quickly that it's not that guilt doesn't exist for the atheist. I mean, the ultimate proof that the pleasure of guilt persists beyond Christianity lies in the popularity of the concept of the cheat meal. What else is a cheat meal if not a kind of sanctioned guilt by which you get to indulge in the seeming excessive um, exception to your rule or your diet by eating something that is more enjoyable precisely because that has been integrated into the normative scheme of that which you are not allowed to do and allowed to do. The cheat meal by itself would not be pleasurable save for this exception. In a sense, it's a sanctioned transgression. And that's what guilt is within the Catholic faith. Guilt is not remorse. Remorse is a kind of deadlock within desire. Remorse is, I have done something bad and I can no longer integrate it within the symbolic order of my being and therefore I am stuck. I can no longer move forward. I, I can't continue to enjoy because I've done this bad thing and I feel so remorseful. Here we see the relationship <clears throat> between remorse and melancholy. The melancholic is stuck because the melancholic, having lost the object of his desire, has now turned loss into its own object. Let's say you're in a relationship and somebody breaks up with you. At a certain point, you have to move on. And yet moving on, strictly speaking, is a double loss, a betrayal of your originary love. After all, to move on means not only have you broken up with me, but now I have to break up with the idea of you in order to be with somebody else. Hence what the melancholic does is to stage a pseudo return to the object of desire, the loved one, but since the loved one is no longer there, we simply have the empty space, the absence of the loved one, which can now be cherished. This means that the melancholic falls in love with his own pain and can therefore no longer move forward. Something analogous to this functions uh, happens with um, uh, remorse. Remorse is when you've done something that you perceive to be bad, which cannot be structurally reintegrated into the symbolic order, and therefore you cannot move on. You become a kind of living dead or walking ghost. You become this, this specter. After all, this is one of the central things, if you think about like American Gothic or all ghost stories, is that ghosts, strictly speaking, 
are stuck between the world of things and the world of the beyond because something is holding them back. Some remorse, something which cannot be structurally integrated and therefore has to be fixed before they can be let go. Hence also why in most ghost stories, the incentive is not for the ghost to return to the living, but precisely for the ghost to be released from the world and be allowed to enter into the realm of the dead. Now, to go back to guilt, guilt therefore is precisely what allows you to keep on enjoying after you have done the supposedly bad thing. Uh, I'll give you an example of this from my own life. Uh, uh, a, week, a week and a half ago, I was in New York City. And in New York City, I went out to, uh, every night at around midnight or so, I would go to one of those all-night diners. Uh, absolutely fabulous. I love all-night diners. And at around 12.30, 1 a.m., after talking a little bit and having a cup of coffee, etc., I would order myself a giant stack of pancakes. Now, strictly speaking, this is a very unhealthy thing to do, to consume a stack of pancakes at 1 in the morning. And as I was eating these pancakes and enjoying this transgression against my ordinary, relatively healthy self, um, I sensed within me the overwhelming urge to confess to my partner, who was sitting across from me, that this indulgence was making me feel guilty, and that once I got home, I would continue to eat in a healthy manner. Now, one night, experiencing this this urge to confess my guilt to my partner, I decided to say nothing, to simply enjoy my pancakes without confessing guilt, to enjoy them for what they were. And I realized that it was impossible. It was impossible not to utter the symbolic confession of guilt. Now, what's key here is that in the utterance, the confession of guilt to the other, Namely, I know that what I am doing is wrong and I will cease to do it once I am home tomorrow. I therefore allowed myself to enjoy the thing, to have it in its own right. Therefore, guilt, rather than being the impediment to the thing, pancakes, became the way in which I accessed the full enjoyment of it. We can actually see this in uh, The Simpsons. There's a wonderful scene in The Simpsons where Homer does this as well where uh, Homer wants to have a donut. And uh, Homer puts the donut on a table, uh, on a plate, sorry, puts a donut on a plate. And he looks up into the heavens and he says, God, if you don't want me to have this donut, give me a sign. Homer waits, nothing happens. And then Homer, Homer says, thank you, God, and eats the donut. This is how desire functions. It is the hysterical interpolation with the absent other that allows us to enjoy in our own right. In other words, Homer enjoys the donut because now it is a transgression that has been sanctioned by the silence of the other. The same thing happens when, when, when I'm in, uh, having pancakes at night and I say to my partner, I know this is wrong. Stop me if you think I shouldn't be doing it and then interpreting the other's silence <clears throat> as a sanctioning of one's own act. Now, the point here is that we have here once again this constitutive paradox, which is that in the profession of guilt or confession, we have an antithetical movement by which I appear to be saying, don't have me do this. And yet it's precisely by this gesture that I am able to enjoy it, that I'm able to step into the gap of my own enjoyment. In other words, <clears throat> I have just confessed my guilt, and yet it, my pleasure, moves. Hence, one of the things that the liberal atheist misses apropos the idea of Catholic guilt is that it's not the specter of remorse that haunts your pleasure, but that it is precisely that which allows you to have pleasure. It's a great uh, passage from Chesterton, which Zizek mentions as as well in some of his writing, where Chesterton says that one of the ironies about the faith is that while it appears to be this restrictive armor, that underneath the armor, there's joy and singing and life and access to direct enjoyment. Hence, also, detour here, if you think about it, the seven deadly sins are never deadly because 
they, you know, distract you from the spiritual dimension of religion and take you into the world of the flesh, etc. The much more radical implication is that the seven deadly sins exist in their own ethically pure, spiritual, universal dimension. Think about, like, um, for example, sins of the flesh, like sexuality. The reason the church is so afraid of sexuality is not because it distracts you from the church, but because, strictly speaking, it is within sexuality that we experience a properly spiritual, higher-than-life exchange. It's precisely not that it is a base material interaction that is therefore too low for the church, but instead the exact opposite, that sexuality is too high, too spiritually transcendent, and therefore precisely a threat to the church. Hence also gluttony. Gluttony isn't simply, oh, you're stuffing your face, and you should be in the church being nice and skinny and thinking about poverty. Instead, it's that within gluttony, we've elevated eating to the level of the sublime. Hence, think about Lacan's definition of the sublime, which is the object elevated to the level of the thing. That is what happens within sexuality or gluttony or the seven deadly sins, is that we've taken an ordinary object and we've elevated it to a spiritual thing. That is what the church fears. Not that you become distracted from the divine, but that you find the divine which in it, within its seeming opposite. Now, again, we have here a form of and yet it moves, which is... What you will find, of course, is that within these movements, like gluttony or sexuality, it's the repetitive element that access, access this transition from the ordinary object into the level of the thing. Think about gluttony. It requires, by definition, eating more. Think about greed. It requires, by definition, wanting more. Think about sexuality, which, in its most vulgar, pure, base, human, like, bodily form, is nothing but repetition, as it were. Now, to go back to the death drive and the pleasure principle, is that this repetition is therefore what allows us to elevate the object, the seemingly ordinary object, into the level of the thing. Repetition, however, by its very nature, has to remain unresolved. You cannot repeat that which has ended. And so what happens within the death drive is that the death drive, in order to entertain this continuing repetition, has to be stuck, has to remain forever unfulfilled, and therefore never reach the true sight of desire as such. In other words, against the principle, the nirvana principle, of the ascension to the final point of happiness, the death drive is precisely that which allows happiness per to persist in its own repetition, in being stuck. Hence, the Wiederholungszwang, or the compulsion to repeat. And now we can see the divine element within this death drive, which is therefore precisely the elevation of the ordinary object into the level of the spiritual thing. That it is the death drive which allows us to access the supposedly excessive true kernel of essence or life in the stalled rupture of its own neurotic repetition. Hence, and yet, it moves. The essence doesn't lie in the ultimate realization of the pleasure principle, but against and above the pleasure principle, the essence persists in what appears to be its antithetical movement, namely in the death drive. Now, Zizek draws all kinds of consequences from this, saying that something similar occurs essentially within Christianity. That this death drive, therefore, isn't simply the ascension of man into the heavens, but precisely the death drive that lies within Christ. Think about baptism, for example. This is something that Paul already understands. That, Paul, that baptism, strictly speaking, the rebirth of the subject, also predicates the death of the subject. The death of the sinful subject and the rebirth of the Christian subject. Now, this in and of itself mirrors the biblical passage from Adam, who falls from paradise or is expelled into the properly horrific subjectivity of human freedom, which is therefore a necessity after paradise. Uh, Adam has to uh, uh, act as of his own accord, in his own accord. That Christ, therefore, isn't simply the redemption of mankind, but that Christ is the antithetical dialectical unfolding of Adam. Namely, not 
Adam falls so that Christ can then walk back up the ladder of divinity, but precisely the tautological overlap by which Adam is Christ. Adam equals Christ. Not that we have a movement like the Nirvana principle where we are lowest and we move towards the highest, which would therefore uphold from a Christian perspective a kind of pagan necessity of the God of the, the, God of the above, but it said that in Hegelian terms, what dies on the cross is precisely the God of the above. Hence, what we find within the crucifixion is the divinity of a kind of <clears throat> death drive, which is that the ideal transcendental horizon of the deity has been ruptured from within. The gap between man and God has been transposed into God himself. Hence, Chesterton's argument that God, in order to be the Christian God, had to, for a moment, become an atheist. And within this movement, within this gap, of course, opens, this gap opens the properly constitutive necessity for human agency to have fidelity to the Christian event, to return to what we talked about before. Hence, we find within the Christian emergence of the Trinity once again, and yet it moves. Zizek's argument, which is quite radical, is to say that Christianity in the Trinity is precisely the only monotheistic faith. Because the monotheistic faith has to persist within this rupturing, the rupturing into three, a three which is also one. Now, of course, we should end here by saying that this is why Hegel is fundamentally a Christian. The entire theory of Hegel's dialectics cannot simply be summarized as thesis, antithesis, synthesis, no matter what people have told you, because this would imply a linear progression or transition, like the Nirvana principle. It's not we start with thesis, then it's negated into antithesis, and finally we arrive at the higher moment of synthesis. Instead, for Hegel, strictly speaking, thesis, antithesis, synthesis is a movement of three in one, that the thesis is always already its own antithesis, which has been synthesized. Hence, the crucial passage in Hegel's logic is that the movement of three might be counted as four. Namely, if it is not simply thesis to antithesis, to synthesis, but that synthesis, sorry, that thesis is always already the pre-synthesized antithesis of its own substance, therefore everything exists as a plus one. The thesis is also its own antithesis and synthesis within itself. And this excessive kernel, this plus one that is always already integrated into its own thing, is the final metaphysical application of Zizek's et pour si move, and yet it moves. This means that Zizek's and yet it moves, which, remember, was supposed to be the title for his magnum opus on Hegel, Less Than Nothing, is an argument that links both to all of, uh, not both, to all of Zizek's obsessions. Lacanian Freudian psychoanalysis, the idea uh, of Christianity, the idea of Kantian Hegelian metaphysics. Here we have everything that Zizek is interested in from a philosophical perspective wrapped into one catchphrase, one concept, and yet it moves. And that's also gonna be the title of my upcoming ebook, And Yet It Moves. If you'd like to sign up for my upcoming ebook, which is going to be coming out next Monday, May 1st, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, if you become a patron today, you'll be able to download both the current ebook and the coming ebook. If you're curious what the ebook's gonna be, my ebook, And Yet It Moves, is gonna be a 100 page explainer, very readable, hopefully, uh, summary of Zizek's ideas that I've just talked about over the past three months, all contained in a small, accessible ebook that you can read and study uh, on your own time. So thank you so much for joining me for this lecture series. It's been wonderful to talk about this. This is the end of the And Yet It Moves lecture series. Although in characteristically, um, I should say, Giacometian fashion, we have gone too far and yet we have not gone nearly far enough. And so next week, not only will I be releasing my ebook, uh, I will also be starting a new lecture series, and I look forward to sharing that with you. If you'd like to be a part of our learning community, if you'd like to help me keep these classes open access and available for anybody everywhere, please do consider becoming a patron. As a patron, you can download my ebook, you can access a whole bunch of other perks and community features, but above all, 
we are a very fun, lively, engaged group of like-minded thinkers and learners who enjoy being passionate about philosophy and theory. And so if you'd like to join our community, if you'd like to learn more, please consider becoming a patron today at www.patreon.com forward slash Jenaline and Julian. I will put the link in the description on YouTube and you can find it in the bio on Instagram. Thank you guys so much for watching. And in about five minutes, we're gonna pick up this discussion in the members only patron Q&A on Discord. See you guys soon.